Martigue is sometimes described as the French Venice. Enjoying espresso and dessert at a waterside bistro. It's a pleasant enough place for an overnight rest before our introduction to our much relished cruise boat that will take us several hundred miles up that same Rhone River flowing past our hotel tonight. The time of late afternoon eventually arrives when we're scheduled to bring our stuff aboard and check in on the French registered MS Camargue. Climbing the aluminum gangplank, we introduce ourselves at the registration desk inside, just to the left. They greet us with a professional smile and we receive the key to room 263. Announcements are given first in French, then repeated in German. When we hear the words, room 263, we learn to listen intently, because a sentence is probably following for our ears. The food consistently is quite good, well presented and served graciously. I think the servers take time to practice their English on these two 60-something Americans. The large wildlife refuge known as the Camargue stretches across the Rhone Delta, not far from Arles. Joining the wild ponies and wilder bulls, these wading flamingos have come to stay. And there is a distinctive cowboy culture throughout the region. Gypsy and Spanish cultural influences are seen everywhere. Food is tapas and paella. Nearby on the river is the Roman settlement of Arles. We decline the guided tour since two weeks hence, we will be living in the little town for seven days. The place appears to be a good choice for that longer stay, pleasantly earnest, but absolutely not cosmopolitan. If there is an old church or monument that you are aware of someplace in Europe, Arles probably contains an older one that's in better condition. But it is a given that this is where the really old stuff is lying around. So very, very many churches and castles drift past in quiet or clanging dignity. Who were the medieval movers and shakers? Who built these and lived here? What good did each do and what evil? What became of their families as the centuries passed? In addition to bridges and impressive castles, the Rhone River is populated by locks. There is a strict protocol for riverboats to follow waiting upstream or downstream until invited to glide into the long and narrow berths where the light eventually changes to green and the massive water doors swing wide. Our boat is about 40 feet wide and we observe about two feet of clearance on each side from us to the enclosing walls. We are tied securely to floating bollards on either side, which ride up and down in steel channels as the water rises and falls with each ship's passage, up and down with no suggestion of grease to quiet the complaining float. There's a kind of a binding post down there that floats when the boat... It's engaging to watch the movable water barriers hinge like giant hydraulic doors or slide sideways or retract vertically into the river's surface as here.
Avignon's bridge to nowhere, at least since the mid-15th century, has a children's song written about it. A palace sits nearby, strong enough and large and luxurious enough for, well, for a pope. It is critical for the boat's captain to monitor the amount of water present within the river banks at any time, so the passengers can float beneath the many bridges in safety. Clearance, as here, can be really snug. Whose was that castle and that one? It's a brisk evening to enjoy a mysterious village stop along the river. Vivier remains a medieval town whose history is now sketchy. Huddled at the base of the church's bell tower, the early medieval buildings remain essentially as they were in the 13th century. To a student of European architecture, the odd little details one passes on these narrow lanes relate remarkable stories of local citizens doing their ordinary daily things. Observing the beautiful Ardèche Valley at any time of the year, one would never suspect even a hint of the almost surreal events that have taken place here in recorded history. Protestantism took hold strongly in this part of France during the time of Calvin, and during the centuries that followed, these beautiful hills saw many religious outrages and absorbed much shed blood. Tens of thousands of Huguenots were slaughtered in the name of Catholic righteousness. And in our own lifetime, when politics had grown even more horrible than the time of the Edict of Nantes, members of the French resistance hid here to survive German savagery during World War II. Far down in the earth beneath these wildflowers, beautiful and sensitive cave murals survive, created when humankind was younger. They are said to rival the splendid and truly ancient artwork deep underground in the caves of Lascaux near Bordeaux. And of course there's the obligatory bus tour pause at one of the local wine show and tell places, which also offers clean restrooms. Even more welcome. Vienne was founded on the banks of the Rhone by Julius Caesar in 47 BC. In its carefully manicured city park, we touch stretches of stone paved road laid down during that same Roman era. A guided trudge through workaday city streets takes us to a kind of hilly hodgepodge of rock walls and foundations, also from 1900 years ago, which surround the recognizable sections of a Roman theater with the sounds of local traffic in the background. Emperor worship was just beginning when Claudius dedicated this temple to the newly designated divinity Augustus and his consort Livia, probably about 50 AD. It was a boutique religion produced for political expediency by imperial lawmakers. Eventually the government's reclassifying rulers as more than mortal embarked on a powerful collision course with Christianity whose claims of absolute transcendent authority would ultimately trump all others. 
we enjoy a thoughtful walk back to the cruise boat. <laughs> Under a clean and beautiful sky, the cathedral in Lyon is a grand and gaudy sort of place and seems decorated not as much for adoration of God as for affirmation of the building's ecclesiastical status. Uniformed fellows inside enforce a dress code for modesty, which young girls must deal with before entering. And they make sure that people like me with cameras do not spread out tripod legs for visitors to trip over. And I remarked to a resident that Yon downtown tower reminded me of a very large stubby pencil. She replied that, yes, that is what people here call it. And finally, this rewarding week is spent. Two days earlier, we made an on-the-fly switch of our next destination, changing from Burgundy to Avignon. The taxi driver is likable as he explains to us how British tourists accuse him of speaking English like an American. Like us, he didn't think that was the put-down it was meant to be. 